Welcome to this series of interviews with the giants of cardiac surgery. My name's Joel Dunning and I'm here at the SDS conference in San Diego with Professor Stuart Jameson. We're actually here in your institution in uh, the University of California, San Diego, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. You trained in uh, London and, uh, and then you went to Stanford and you were the uh, Director of Transplantation there and you, you were involved in the world's first heart-lung transplant. You went to Minnesota and then came back here to the University of California as Head of Cardiothoracic Surgery and Director of Heart and Lung Transplantation. You've been the past President of the ISHLT but the thing that uh, the world knows you for is pulmonary thromboendarterectomy. Um, a lot of people say that you've performed more than the whole rest of the world put together and I believe you've, you've actually performed about 2,600 of these operations and it's this that we'd like to talk to you about. We'd like to go through your, your exact techniques and your hints and tips for, for safe surgery in this, this very successful program you've got here. Uh, but before we go into the operating theatre and actually talk about your technique, I wonder if you could say a few words on on out there trying to find these patients how we under diagnosis is a problem isn't it and uh, and how do we find these people and make sure uh, they are diagnosed correctly and put the right way mm. one of the most important things about this condition is that it is as you say very undiagnosed um, we think that there are about um, 600,000 a minimum of 600,000 survivors of acute thromboembolic events. And of course, many people present to us with no history at all of either deep venous thrombosis or history of acute PE, so the numbers must be higher than that. And then there's about a 5% incidence of chronic thromboembolic disease and chronic pulmonary hypertension after an acute event. So the minimum number that we estimate must present in the United States alone are about 15,000 new cases a year. Now, we, we estimate that probably about 200 pulmonary endarectomies are done every year in the United States, and we do most of them. So there's a vast disparity between the number of operations we're doing and the number of people we think that are out there that are suffering, uh, that are suffering with this condition. And uh, everybody that has an acute PE, should they be being followed up to check that they don't uh, get? That's a good question, John, and I think that's true. I think people ought to be followed up, and as you know, they generally are not. And it's, it's quite easy to follow these people up. Uh, one of the things that we find, and maybe one of the reasons that the condition is very undiagnosed, is that people often are only symptomatic at exercise. So you are sitting in your doctor's office saying, doctor, I can't exercise. And you might have no signs or symptoms because at a cardiac output of three or four, you can cope with that. The minute you try and increase your cardiac output, there's a restriction to outflow, rather like aortic stenosis or pulmonary stenosis. What you have here is a restriction to outflow through the lungs, and people become very symptomatic at rest. And so it's not until people actually progress into right heart failure, then finally people understand what the condition is. So I think that everybody who, with a documented um, pulmonary embolism, ought to be followed yearly probably with a cardiac echo. Cardiac echo is easy and, and it'll, it'll document any evidence of pulmonary hypertension. So you've been referred a patient perhaps that, uh, that is getting some pulmonary hypertension, they've had PEs in the past and we're, we, we want to investigate them fully to, to see if they're a candidate for thromboendarterectomy. Uh, what tests do you think are absolutely vital and what are optional? So we would progress with a VQ scan, that's always very helpful, you know, you normally see normal ventilation and then you see large mismatched defects on perfusion. One word of caution about the VQ scan is that it can underestimate the degree of disease. We would then uh, go ahead uh, uh, probably with an exercise echo to see what happens to the pulmonary pressures. Um, 
And we still perform pulmonary angiograms on almost everybody. Um, there's a lot of um, investigation now into MRI and CT scans, but we don't feel that you can get a good idea, um, certainly of peripheral disease, without a pulmonary angiogram. So almost everybody that we see will have a pulmonary angiogram. And it's safe to perform that in pulmonary hypertension? safe to perform. I, I, you know, historically there's some data out there that said that it wasn't. But um, we have now done thousands of these pulmonary angiograms. Um, no mortality, minimal morbidity, so I believe it is safe. So while we're on investigations, I wonder if you could just say a few words about the grading of thrombohendritorectomy, because it is important for our following. Yes, it is. So some years ago, probably 10 or 15 years ago, when other people started doing the operation, I felt it was important that we establish some sort of grading system so that w when we talk to our colleagues at other institutions, we can compare similar cases. Because, I mean, every pulmonary endarterectomy is different. Um, and I often say it's like a game of chess. You might say to somebody, well, I played chess yesterday, no point doing it again. Every chess game is very different from the last. And one of the fascinating things about pulmonary endarterectomy is that every case is different. And therefore, every operative technique has to be varied somewhat. So the grading system that we came up with has four types. And type one is when you open the pulmonary artery and you see thrombus, you actually see thrombus. And with our experience now, that's less and less cases, maybe 10%. The vast majority of cases, you look in there and on superficial examination of the pulmonary artery, it looks almost normal. You may see some thickening, you may see some webs or bands, but oftentimes you don't see anything until you're in circulatory arrest and you can see distally in the bed. But the intima is thickened with the scar-like tissue, which um, is the resolution of thrombus, which becomes incorporated into the pulmonary artery wall. And that can be taken out. And then type three, <coughs> we're seeing more and more of those cases. Now, um, 30 to 40 percent of our cases are type three, much more difficult. Um, these are the cases that are often referred to as inoperable or the disease is too distal. And actually you have to go down and raise the endarterectomy specimen at each segmental or subsegmental level. So it's more difficult, it's more time consuming. And uh, these people tend to have longer standing disease and higher pulmonary vascular resistance. It's often associated with indwelling lines like pacemakers, um, AV shunts, that sort of thing. Uh, type 4 is really a disease that's not thromboembolic and, and l less and less, but still we do operate on people. That's essentially a misdiagnosis. So they may have vasculitis. They may have primary pulmonary hypertension which sometimes is associated with secondary distal thrombosis, but it's not thromboembolic disease. They may have um, some type of Eisenmenger type change. And we do see Eisenmenger type change in some of our patients. Something to do, I think, with the increased pressure and flow in the remaining open bed after pulmonary embolism. Um, so those are the main, those are the types, and actually, although it's a post-operative grading system, we grade it according to what we see, because you can relate now what we've seen so often post-operatively to the pre-operative films and investigations, you can generally judge pre-op what type of disease you're going to be dealing with. So just, just honing you down on that one, when, when I read your paper, the first 1,500 cases you've done, it's, a, it's an article that's been, been cited by over 100 other papers. The thing that really brought me out in a cold sweat there was your descriptions of the cases that you go in and it wasn't 
uh, classic pulmonary thrombotectomy territory that you could use, something like an angiosarcoma or, as you say, the type 4s. Are there any tips or hints you can give to us to try and spot these people before you take them to theatre? Right. So, first to get to dismiss the angiosarcomas, we do do pulmonary endarterectomies for angiosarcoma, and it's, it's almost never curative but you will take somebody who is dying with right heart failure and complete obstruction of the uh, pulmonary vascular bed and you can get into an endarterectomy plane and you can take it out. It generally recurs after a year or two. These are aggressive tumors and unfortunately not very sensitive to either chemotherapy or radiotherapy, but we will prolong somebody's life. Um, now, the, the type the classic type 4, that is non-obstruct, non-obstructive at main pulmonary artery level, but really at capillary level, um, of course, is the type that you want to avoid. Um, the, the, the greatest risk factor for us is discordance between the degree of angiographic obstruction and the pulmonary vascular resistance. So people have written about, and it's true in our experience too, that the higher the pulmonary vascular resistance, the higher the risk of operation. So if somebody has a pulmonary vascular resistance of 500, and we use Dines, which is the same as Wood units times 80, so that's the conversion factor, but say 500, even if you took no obstructing material out, in our experience, if you leave the operating room with a pulmonary vascular resistance of less than 500, the mortality rate's essentially zero. If you leave the operating room with a pulmonary vascular resistance of more than 500, mortality rate's something like 25%. So everything is hinged towards complete removal of all obstructing material. And if you bring me a patient with a pulmonary vascular resistance of 2,000, which is very high, but on the angiogram, there's every reason to have a pulmonary vascular resistance of 2,000. They've only got 20% of their pulmonary vasculature open. That patient's going to have a good result with low risk because you're going to cure them. The, the danger sign goes up when you have a pulmonary vascular resistance of 2,000 and the type of disease that you see on the angiogram where you would predict that patient might really ought to have a pulmonary vascular resistance a quarter of that. Because that indicates either that you have some other condition with pulmonary emboli superimposed or in some cases of long-standing disease, you get a type of Eisenmenger condition in the remaining open vessels due to increased pressure of flow or other factors we don't know about. But the point in those patients is you are only going to help them to the extent you can take out thromboembolic material. And they're going to be left with a higher pulmonary vascular resistance. Now, we, we still operate on those patients because you can help them, and there's no other option other than lung transplantation. But we warn them that they're higher risk, and we warn them that they may be left with residual disease. But function, it's rather like the S curve, the, S, the, the oxygen dissociation curve, that <coughs> with this being very good function, and this being very poor function, in terms of exercise capability and in terms of being on oxygen or off, off oxygen. And this being low pulmonary vascular resistance, this being high pulmonary vascular resistance, you can often push somebody this way a little bit, not make them normal, but shoot them right up the, uh, that S-curve in terms of function. And uh, so we've talked a lot there about sort of high-risk patients and uh, uh, you, you take a wide variety of sort of uh, physical health as well I, I believe 
your oldest patient might even have been 84. And uh, is there anything else that makes the patient high risk? You, you can take a wide range of patients. Yeah, we would, it, we would uh, pretty much take anybody. Um, there's no degree of pulmonary vascular resistance we would turn somebody down for. No degree of right heart failure we'd turn somebody down for. The only other restrictions I, I think are applicable to any heart surgery. If somebody has advanced cancer, you might reconsider um, that sort of thing. Right, so let's talk about the operation. Um, so obviously, before we even make the first incision, we need to monitor this patient safely. What monitoring do you insist on from an anaesthetist? Because we're, we're obviously going to cool down and switch off. Yeah, so the things that we do differently from regular open heart surgery is that we use a femoral arterial line as well as a radial arterial line. And the reason for that is that uh, when we're rewarming the patient in an immediate post-op period, the vasoconstriction after hypothermia tends to make the radial artery line a little bit unreliable. And there's usually a gradient of 20 to 30 millimeters between the two. So we tend to go with the femoral artery line. Um, the other issue is with regard to cerebral protection. We protect the head with a cooling jacket. It's actually modified from an orthopedic jacket that's used for knee surgery, but wrap it around the head. Um, we use a, a tympanic membrane probe for temperature. We use a rectal temperature probe, and we use a temperature probe in the um, Foley catheter. And uh, we monitor brain function with EEG. Uh, but otherwise similar to regular open heart surgery. And you, you don't use sort of near infrared spectroscopy or sort of uh, venous sats or anything like that and not, don't find them useful particularly? Um, we do measure the venous sats on the pump and the main uh, utility of that, it, particularly in the type 3 patients, uh, we cool down to 20 degrees centigrade then initiate circulatory arrest and Usually you can get um, the entire pulmonary endarterectomy on one side done within that 20 minutes. Sometimes, and increasingly so with the very distal disease that we see, um, you might need more time. So we're fairly strict about the fact that after 20 minutes, maximum 25 minutes, we'll reinstitute flow. And the venous sats at the time that we reinstitute flow are usually in the 40s. We, we reperfuse for 10 minutes, at which time the venous sats will be in the 90s. And then we start again for another 20 minute period. And just with regard to your cooling protocol, do you, do you have any rules to the speed of cooling or how long you like to be cool before you switch off? Right, so I think that's important, an important question. We tend to um, maintain uh, no more than a, 20, a, a 10 degree gradient between the inflow temperature and the and the body temperature. So we cool rather slowly. Cooling period will be 45 minutes to an hour on a regular sized patient. Uh, Rewarming period might be um, an hour to two hours. But uh, you know this is an operation that can't be hurried. Um, these are very sick patients. All the money is in that 20 minute period of endarterectomy. And if you follow the rules that we've established, and it, it, it's a very safe operation. Do you use any drugs for cerebral protection, thyroid, pentol, mannitol, dexamethasone? We, we do. We, we, we don't use steroids, but we, we do use mannitol, thyroid, pentol. Yeah. And, and if people are interested in this uh, warming jacket, in this cooling jacket for the head, I think you use it around the heart as well. Um, and where do you actually get them from? Is this a, it's, it's literally from orthopedics, is it, this yes, jacket? I don't think you can actually buy them for the head, can you? No, I don't think so. Um, I expect we've written about it in one of the papers. Easily findable. And uh, so uh, we've already talked about uh, the cooling and rewarming, but uh, take a little step back. Is, are there any hints and tips of cannulation? I mean, where do you put the cannula just to, pro to provide the best access to the pulmonary yeah. arteries? We, um, we cannulate the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava independently, so bicaval cannulation. Um, and um, high aortic cannulation at the region of the innominate artery. Um, once we're cool, 
we develop a plane of uh, dissection to mobilize the superior vena cava. So the approach is actually between the superior vena cava and the aorta. You would think, just conceptually, that the easiest way to get to the pulmonary artery would be lateral to the superior vena cava. But it's much easier to go more medially because you then have a straight shot to see all the way down to the very distal pulmonary vascular bed. So we mobilize the superior vena cava. We use a cerebellar retractor to push the superior vena cava laterally. The, the retractor goes between the superior vena cava and the aorta, expose the pulmonary artery under the superior vena cava, and the incision goes from the aorta down past the upper lobe vessel, a little bit past the middle lobe, down into the lower lobe. We stay intrapericardially. We, we never open the pericardial cavity. And um, it's important to stay in the middle of the vessel. And then usually there's a fair amount of backflow. And I am really puzzled by uh, the fact that about every three or four months somebody sends me a paper to review a new and improved way to do pulmonary and arterectomies. Well, that's the human condition, you know, there's always a better way. My old chief, Shamway, would say, as soon as something's working perfectly, somebody will try and change it. So things but like anti-grade cerebral perfusion. All sorts of things, you know, and, mm -hmm. but you really can't see unless you get total circulatory rest. Now, of course, it's possible to do pulmonary and endonorectomy any way you want, but it is impossible to do a complete endonorectomy without circulatory rest. It is flatly impossible. And everything hinges on getting every single bit of distal disease out, because mortality in the post-op result is only related to the post-operative pulmonary vascular resistance. It's not related to length of operation. It's not related to bypass time, cross clamp time, ischemic time, cerebral ischemic time. It's only related to post-op PBR. So you have to get everything out. That's why we use circorest. And on that issue of getting it all out, how do you know when you've gone far enough? Um, so the first thing you do is develop a plane. And uh, you can't just develop any plane, unfortunately. You've got to develop the plane where the disease begins. And sometimes that means actually developing a plane way down in the lower lobe. And we use a long beaver blade to get down there. You need a good headlight, of course. And we use this special instrument, if you'll pardon the expression, it's called a Jameson dissector. It's a little dissector with a sucker on the end. and. Um, you can often raise the plane with that dissector. And you must stay in that plane. Now, if, if the plane gets a little bit pink, then you're getting out towards the adventitia, and that's too deep. And uh, if the plane is not thick enough, then you won't get out to the distal vessel. So the, the, the true plane is probably about halfway through the media. And we actually take out half the media and the adventitia and the clot, of course. I mean, not the adventitia, the intima and the clot. And you stay with that plane, and you go down to the very distal vessels, all the way to the diaphragm. And you, you know when you've come to the end, because there's a tail, like a rat's tail, and there isn't any more disease. And um, by progressively dissecting down, and progressively liberating branches, the rest of it slowly comes up. And, and is the view good? Have you ever used angioscopy or anything like that? You can get no, a good view if you do. You, know, you, you can see perfectly. Yeah. You need to tilt the table a little bit. You need to make the incision in the right place. You need to do your endarterectomy in the right place. And you need to tilt the table when you're on the uh, when you, when you're on the patient's left side operating on the right to tilt the patient downwards away from you and the same on the other side and you can look down directly every single vessel yeah. and, and you do the right hand side first and then the left. generally we do the right and um, I, uh, that's really because it's more convenient for the surgeon to stay on the patient's left side do the right side 
while you're sewing up the right pulmonary artery you can reperfuse again change sides do the left side and once you've done with the left side you can rewarm once you're sewing up the left pulmonary artery and you're then standing on the so-called surgeon side the right hand side of the patient should you need now to do a coronary bypass aortic valve mitral valve repair um, or close an atrial septal defect so that that would be your exit operation just just a tiny note on on alpha stat versus ph stat what do you do for cooling we reward? use alpha stat yeah alpha okay and uh, so that's uh, that's the pulmonary endarterectomy sort of part of it. And as, as you alluded to, there are other procedures we can do. These people have pulmonary hypertension and, and right heart failure, so tricuspid regurgitation is is very very common. Uh, should we repair them all? Yeah, a good question. So um, they all have tricuspid regurgitation, and often it's severe. But um, unless there's evidence of some organic dysfunction of the tricuspid valve, we don't we don't deal with that. We leave it and uh, invariably within a few days in fact almost immediately the right heart remodels and we learned this from the early days of lung transplantation you can take somebody with huge pulmonary hypertension massive tricuspid regurgitation the minute you take your thumb off the end of the pipe the whole right heart remodels and when it remodels the tricuspid valve regains its size and function and I think actually it would be a hindrance if you put in a ring or something like that because it would cause artificial distortion. Mm. So we don't address the tricuspid valve unless there's some organic lesion in there. Yeah, and, and I believe all your patients get IVC filters before the operation. When we do the angiogram we put in an IVC filter and post-operatively they're committed to lifelong anticoagulation. What INR level? INR between two and three. Yeah. So uh, that was a, a fantastic insight in, into your practice and surgeons out there that, uh, that are thinking there's a great need in my country or we really need to set up a program, th there is a big learning curve with this isn't there? There is, yeah, it, it, so uh, it, this afternoon at the SDS we're presenting our data on 2600 patients and we've stratified them out uh, into various cohorts with time. Now prior to 1990, and we're only looking then at 180 patients, there was a 17% mortality, 1-7. And then it fell uh, between 1990 and um, oh, um, about 2000 to somewhere around 8%. Uh, for the last 500 patients, the mortality rate taking all comers which included angiosarcomas and uh, some misdiagnoses with uh, sarcoid and uh, people with concomitant, uh, concomitant operations, the overall mortality was 2.2 percent. But we've now, better touch wood here, we now, for the last 260 consecutive patients undergoing isolated PTE, there's been no mortality. Fantastic, and, and, and cerebral-wise, you, you get very good outcomes as well, don't you? There is no difference. The stroke rate is less than 1%, no difference to regular heart surgery, and we do not encounter delirium, uh, delirium or any other cerebral event. Because if you, if you, if you adhere to the technique, you won't, you won't get problems. And that's why I'm puzzled by the need for people to try and find an improved way of doing it. You'd be hard put, I think, to improve on a 2.2% mortality taking the type of patients that we take um, with, with really no difference in morbidity to any other heart surgery. Yeah, and, and the key to that cerebral excellent outcome really is what's the jacket, the slow cooling, and uh, and they're the two key elements, I suppose, isn't it? Right, and don't and don't and and don't. If you need to take extra time, don't panic about it. Just restart the circulation, and um, then then do another twenty minute period. So, even if you take forty minutes on each side, you're still going to be safe. Now, in in the in the last oh thousand patients or so, that they 
average circulatory rest time was about 35 minutes, which counts both sides. So it's pretty short, but we've done a lot of them. Our circulatory rest times are now going up. And the reason is that we, we understand now that the money is entirely in, taking all the time you need to get every piece of disease out. That's why you get a great survival. And it doesn't matter if you take longer. And of course, we're getting sent people with more and more distal disease. So we don't use the term. We don't believe there's any disease that is inoperable, surgically inaccessible. And I find it very distressing that I still read in papers, particularly in Europe, people saying surgically inaccessible disease or inoperable disease. If the disease is thromboembolic, it's operable. And those worst and illest patients who ever had situations where the heart has been so bad from pulmonary hypertension you've needed balloon pumps, inotropes or even ECMO? Or so, uh, yeah, I can't remember ever using a balloon pump in a PT patient. Um, our average cross clamp time, aortic cross clamp time is uh, 90 minutes, a little over 90 minutes. We use one dose of cold cardioplegia in the beginning one liter, and then the jacket, and then forget about it. And cardiac function is always perfect. Uh, with reference to the ECMO, less than 1% of our patients, we have used venovenous ECMO. And that's been in somebody that gets this um, rabid reperfusion response, which we still don't quite understand. There seems to be no rhyme or reason why it happens in some people and not others. But if we get a vicious reperfusion response that we can't control with ventilation and management, regular management, and we feel that the patient has very reversible disease, we will support them with ECMO. And uh, if someone's out there and they've come off bypass, there's a sudden gush up the, up the ET tube with, with a load of blood. Yeah, so, uh, th well, that's a usually fatal event. Um, it's all about being in the right plane. It's usually, I think it's, all, it, it's, it's happened to us. So, uh, it, we've certainly, we've certainly done something bad when it happened. Uh, um, I think generally, you've breached the uh, a barrier between the alveoli and the, and the, and the vessel wall for that to happen. We often get very thin with our endo endarterectomies, and I think provided you're in the correct plane, even if it's a thin plane, um, you'll be all right. We have had two cases where somebody has had severe hemoptysis that, that I know we were in the correct plane all the way. And I think the reason for that was that uh, they they had developed necrosis uh, in a in an area of pulmonary emboli, and that's very rare, as you know, because it was Trendelenburg that first pointed out that the lung has a dual blood supply, and that's the rationale for this operation. You know, unlike operating on somebody who's had a stroke or a dead leg or something. You can have pulmonary emboli that are totally occlusive, that go on for years and years. The parenchyma is kept alive, the lung parenchyma is kept alive by the bronchial arteries. You can go back years later, restore flow, and everything's fine. The very rare patient, I think, will develop an area of necrotic tissue. And then you do an endarterectomy, and you revascularize that necrotic area and I think you get him up. So, so we've had two cases like that where I was certain that we didn't violate the barrier between blood and lung that bled. And that's a usually fatal condition. I mean, it's very hard to manage that. By the time you understand what's happening, you do bronchoscopy, you go back on bypass, there's blood coming every way. It's hard to tell which side it's coming from. Um, we try and manage them where they end up bronchial blocker. If you can find out where it's coming from, block that bronchus. Um, almost invariably fatal love. 
Well, thank you for that excellent uh, insight. I just wanted to ask you one other thing about uh, obviously something that us as average surgeons see much more often. It's, it's the acute pulmonary embolus. And uh, uh, first of all, just wanted to ask you perhaps uh, who should we be operating on uh, for acute massive PE? There are very good guidelines for the medical treatment, but not really so good for the yeah. surgical treatment. John, I think that's a very difficult question to answer, and I, I don't know what the true answer is. Um, when I was at the Brompton Hospital in the early 70s, Matt Panath, who was senior surgeon at the time, had developed a sort of national reputation for operating on people with acute pulmonary emboli, and we did it quite a lot. They were often unstable, it was dangerous to put them to sleep and so on. But he got pretty good results. I think since then, with learning more about the condition, I think that we've understood that most people that are going to die with an acute pulmonary embolus are going to die before you can get to them. So with a massive acute pulmonary embolus, about 10% of people are going to die. And by the time you can stabilize them and get to the operating room, the people that would get to the operating room are probably going to survive anyway. And uh, they'll generally lies their clot over time. So I think, I think I'm very uncertain as to what one should do about acute pulmonary embolism. And, and thrombolysis is a fantastically successful thrombolysis treatment. Thrombolysis is very helpful and if you have them in the cath lab you can often break up the clot or suck the clot, clot out. Yeah, without they, going to surgery. Yeah, even if, they, if they're coming to you, you can give thrombolysis, they may have got sufficiently better to cancel the procedure. Yeah, I think so. I suppose, yeah. And if, if you were giving advice to a surgeon who was going to do a acute PE, how would you, would you put them on bypass? Would you cross clamp or yeah, just no, leave for the sure. cross clamp off? Yeah, so Trendelenburg did the first ones and he did them with inflow occlusion um, and then opening up the pulmonary artery. But I think with modern technology, actually that was first described by Cooley in the 1960s that the survival rate is much better on bypass because you can take your time, the patient's stable, you can get more clot out. So I definitely would uh, put the patient on bypass. I'd probably uh, allow the patient to drift to about 30 degrees, um, open up both right and left pulmonary emboli and um, start with suction, suck as much out, of, out as you can on both sides and then if there's any residual maybe use a small Fogarty catheter very gently to remove any residual cloud. That's very helpful and uh, I think we're there really, that's, uh, that's been a fantastic insight uh, to your amazing practice here and also brilliant advice both for just cooling and acute PEs for, for us average surgeons. Um, just to close with really, I mean around the world if people are sort of watching this and they think gosh I've got a really difficult patient, I'm very young in the program, can people contact you for advice and, and help? Yeah, um, this, this happens all the time and, and you, you know of course it's, it's part of our functions as physicians to help others and help teach others whenever we can. So um, it's true we do have a vast experience if there's any way of passing on that experience to people or um, we're certainly happy to see the more difficult patients and even at uh, experienced centers here in the United States they will still send us their very distal patients. Um, we're easily available by email obviously or by telephone um, and one other thing that happens regularly at least once a month we host a team here from elsewhere either in the United States or overseas and you, we usually have a surgeon, anesthesiologist, pulmonologist, always very welcome to come and see what we do here. Well, that's fantastic. You've been an absolute inspiration and, uh, and your work's uh, unparalleled. So, so for me, Joel Dunning and everyone at CTS, I'd just like to say thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Joel.